I'm Cecilia Lay, and this is Fifth Emission. While empty storefronts and a slow pandemic recovery have plagued other parts of San Francisco, Hayes Valley has been thriving. The neighborhood has managed to remain a retail bright spot in the city. Dozens of new shops and restaurants have popped up in recent years, and there's a buzzy vibe if you just walk its streets. That energy is most evident at Proxy, the unofficial town square of Hayes Valley. Proxy opened more than a decade ago as a kind of city experiment. It's an open space adjacent to a small park with shipping containers that have been converted into boutiques. There's an ice cream and coffee shop, a beer garden, and residents gather there to exercise and watch free outdoor movies and concerts. It was only meant to be a placeholder for permanent development, but in the 12 years since it's opened, proxies become much more. For residents like Jennifer Laska, the space is a community living room. It really drives this feeling of the neighborhood being alive, and that's one of the reasons that a lot of the empty storefronts during COVID filled up so quickly is because people saw this space as being vibrant. And every time I'm in the area, I run into people I know, so it it really does feel like the living room for the community. There's just one problem, though. Proxy sits on a parcel that was made vacant by the demolition of the Central Freeway in 2003. Nearly a quarter century ago, San Francisco voters approved legislation that would convert that parcel into affordable housing. And now the city is finally fulfilling that decades-old promise. Soon it will issue a request for proposal from nonprofit housing groups to build 100% affordable housing on the site. Some Hayes Valley residents, like Robin Levitt, say it's the right thing to do. For people who work and serve us in San Francisco, who work at places like Trader Joe's or Walgreens, we need to have housing that these people can afford. Otherwise, we lose some of the diversity and the vitality and the greatness and the strength of the city. Today on Fifth Emission, Chronicle reporter J.K. Deneen joins me to discuss a thorny debate in Hayes Valley. Should affordable housing replace a beloved de facto town square? Should the city's urgent need and state mandate to build over 40,000 units of affordable housing trump the desire to keep this unique community space? J.K. Deneen, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. J.K., there's a plot of land at the heart of a contentious housing debate in Hayes Valley. It's called Proxy, and a lot of residents really love it. What's it like? And what kind of role has it played in the neighborhood? Well, Proxy is about 11,000 square feet, and it serves as sort of an extension to Patricia's Green, which is the the park along the new Octavia Boulevard that was built when they took the freeway down about 15 years ago. It was and has always been slated for affordable housing, but as an interim use, about a dozen years ago, they opened Proxy which is just a collection of shipping containers and small kiosks. There's a bunch of comfortable red chairs and tables, and people hang out there and have meetings. So it sort of feels like one open public space that does serve as a, as kind of a de facto town square. As you mentioned, there's been this long plan to convert it into affordable housing, and that's something that San Francisco voters decided back in 1999. Tell me the story behind that. Yeah, so when they took down the freeway, there were about 22 of these orphan parcels that were owned by Caltrain and were handed over to San Francisco Redevelopment Agency. And the idea was that housing would be built on them, and that happened. All but, I believe, six of them have been developed, some as large market rate projects, about four of them as affordable The ones that uh, have not been developed are the smaller ones. It's harder to get public financing, tax credit, or affordable housing bond money for small projects. And so they've kind of languished. And meanwhile, some of them have found these great other uses um, and have really been embraced by the community. Tell me more about the role that San Francisco voters had in securing these parcels for housing. There are actually three propositions, I believe one in in 97, one in 98, and one in 99 that dealt with various aspects of taking down the freeway and what would happen to the the underlying land. Prop I was the the third of those three. It was pushed by activists in in Hayes Valley and Western Edition and and politicians back in the day like Tom Amiano and Mark Leno. 
who you know really came up with this vision for the the new Hayes Valley, and that was a hard hard fought victory for neighbors, and it, it and it became law. So the city has an obligation to honor those promises. At least that's the point of view of some of the residents that were in the trenches back then. Well, is there a legal mandate to fulfill voters' wishes, you know, from back in 1999? That is what the debate is going to come down to, whether what voters decided back then has to be honored. Even though it is a long time ago, things have changed. It is a small parcel. It's hard to develop. It would probably not be too competitive. All of the different cities around California compete for public money. And the the money tends to go to bigger projects, which are more efficient. Whereas this is a very small site, it would be very expensive to develop and you wouldn't get that many units out of it. Well, what San Francisco is now preparing to do is issue a request for a nonprofit housing group to come up with a plan to build 50 to 75 units on this plot of land, which has become this beloved neighborhood square. And the plan is to make it 100% affordable housing. And before we get into this particular debate in Hayes Valley, how hard is the task of building fully affordable housing in the city right now? There's a lot of projects in the pipeline. There's projects that have been approved for years and years and years. And every year, those projects go into this competitive process to try to get funding from the state government and the local government. So there's literally tens and thousands of units already in in the pipeline. And so this project would have to compete with those other developments. On the other hand, the city owns the land. It's a well, highly resourced neighborhood in terms of schools and city hall is right there and retail and Market Street and public transit. So from many points of view, it's an ideal place to put affordable housing. So I would say most San Francisco residents, JK, understand that the city desperately needs affordable housing and more housing. So tell me more about why Hayes Valley residents are opposed to developing this particular area. Why would preserving this sort of community living room, as some people call it, why is that more important to them? It's where families gather in Patricia Green and and next door at Proxy. It's really become a place where neighbors meet each other. It adds to the vitality in the retail corridor there on Hayes Street. I spoke to Jen Laska, who is the president of the Hayes Valley Neighborhood Association and who considers herself a, a big of affordable housing and, and all kinds of housing. But on this particular issue, she's very much in favor of of keeping the town square. I think the neighborhood would be losing a a vibrant community gathering space. It's the heart of Hayes Valley. Um, It's where everybody meets and says hello to each other. But most importantly, I think during the pandemic, we understood how important open space is to people's happiness and mental health. And we would hate to see that go. Once it's gone, you can't get it back. She feels that the neighborhood lacks sufficient places for people to hang out and play. There's been thousands and thousands of units built, not just in Hayes Valley proper, but in the surrounding neighborhoods, like the hub. There's all those towers now around Van Ness and Market Streets. And really, Hayes Valley serves as an adjacent place for for them to go. This is um, the only open space that we have next to our commercial corridor. We have a couple of small parks in Hayes Valley, but Hayes Valley is actually already below average for the city in terms of open space acreage per person. So if we lose proxy, it goes down even further. Well, like you mentioned, you said Laska considers herself to be an advocate for affordable housing. Does she think that there are other places in Hayes Valley that could be a better fit for it? She and her other Hayes Valley residents who would like to keep proxy have brought up One Oak, which is a stalled residential tower, The Oak, which is at 55 Oak Street, which is an empty apartment building that was completed more than two years ago, but has has remained empty the entire time. Some of the remaining freeway parcels could also be affordable housing, but they're small. They're more like 20, 25, 30 units. 
as opposed to proxy, which originally the city said 50, but now they're thinking they might be able to get as many as 100 units there, which would make it probably more marketable as far as being able to get some public funding for a project. Why are some Hayes Valley residents okay with the idea of losing proxy, even as it's become so beloved by their neighbors? We'll hear from one resident after a quick break. You're listening to Fifth and Mission. You can support the newsroom that creates this podcast by signing up for unlimited access at sfchronicle.com slash pod or by downloading the San Francisco Chronicle app. J.K. Deneen, before the break, we heard from one resident who thinks the de facto town square proxy is worth keeping in Hayes Valley, even as San Francisco is in desperate need of more affordable housing. Why do other residents disagree? The promises made through the propositions that that neighbors worked for decades on, you know, they feel like those ought to be upheld. Robin Levitt is a longtime Hayes Valley activist and architect, and he was co-chair of the 1999 measure, Prop I, which really solidified all the plans around taking down the freeway and what to do with the the space that that would be freed up. As much as people love to watch outdoor movies a few times a year and go to a coffee shop, those functions can happen someplace else. We made a commitment in place of a a freeway, we would get a surface boulevard, a park, Patricia's Green, and we would provide sites for housing, some of which would be affordable. That was the agreement we made. So I believe in sticking with agreement. I heard from a, a jazz piano player who said that he's played dozens of concerts at Proxy, especially during the pandemic. Yet he is supportive of the housing there because he thinks that it's more important to build some affordable units for working class people than it is to have some you know, $5 cappuccinos and a place for, for him to play piano. Now, JK, you've written that this debate has been energized maybe in part because of the big changes that have happened in Hayes Valley recently. If you spend some time in the neighborhood, it feels pretty lively. I mean, it's busy. Retail seems really busy there, too. And it doesn't quite fit this doom loop scenario that we hear so often about in San Francisco. Is that also part of the reason why some residents are so protective of this space that Proxy occupies? There's a lot that isn't going right in San Francisco right now in terms of vacant retail and downtown being empty. And and so in that context, it feels like proxy is a huge success story. In a sense, Hayes Valley is kind of could be seen as a victim of its own success. The plan to take down the freeway worked beyond you know anyone's wildest imagination. It really created this new Hayes Valley, which is incredibly attractive. But that's led to, you know, higher rents, some very expensive stores selling $600 shoes and $300 sunglasses. There's plenty of people who live in Hayes Valley and the adjacent neighborhoods who probably can't afford to, to shop there very much and maybe feel a little bit left out and, and long for kind of the, the old days. I mean, you've mentioned $5 cappuccinos, $600 shoes. I mean, are there class issues at play in this sort of debate, you think? I do. There's definitely a feeling that that proxy does cater to kind of the the new money, some of the younger tech workers who who have embraced Hayes Valley and really helped make it what it is, which is a really lively, vibrant neighborhood. They really want to protect, you know, what they've helped create. And that makes sense, I guess, from their point of view. But at the same time, people who support the development, like Robin Levitt, like you mentioned, they think it would send a pretty strong message if the affordable housing development happens at proxy. What kind of message would that send? One of the the things that I've heard that people said at the meetings, but I never heard it myself, is that, you know, that the people that live in these affordable units wouldn't be able to afford to shop on Hay Street. That is sort of an, an undercurrent of the whole debate if they can get 100 units of deeply affordable family housing in the heart of one of the most trendy neighborhoods on the West Coast would really send the message that San Francisco is 
is a place for everybody. And the point that Robin makes also is that there are a lot of jobs on Hay Street that don't necessarily pay particularly well. You've got the busboys and the waiters and the retail clerks and like those people right now, where are they living? If you build affordable housing there in the center of the neighborhood, you're saying this neighborhood is not just for the elite, for people with lots of money who can shop at these shops. We also welcome people who may not have the highest income, who can't normally afford to live here. We welcome them into this neighborhood. It's making a very symbolic statement. Now, Hayes Valley is a part of District 5, which is represented by City Supervisor Dean Preston. Preston often gets criticized for his housing votes by those who advocate for more housing growth. Where does he stand on this parcel of land, and how does it compare to how he's weighed in on other housing issues in the city? Yeah, he's very adamant this affordable housing project will be built. In some ways, it's a little bit unusual because on this particular project, his view is aligned with that of the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development. He's a big critic of that agency and of Mayor Breed in general. But in this particular case, both the city agencies and Dean Preston are committed to building the affordable housing there. It's also really important to remember that San Francisco has this state mandate to build a certain number of affordable housing units, and the city's struggling to do that. What would be the consequences for San Francisco if it doesn't achieve their goals? The city has to build 82,000 units altogether, 46,000 of which are supposed to be affordable to low and moderate income families. In that context, 100 units or 50 units or 75 units or whatever proxy would yield doesn't seem like a lot, but, you know, every unit counts. San Francisco's under a great deal of scrutiny from the state in terms of being anti-development. And and so I think this is something that potentially the the state housing officials will be paying attention to in terms of like living up to promises to deliver housing. JK, as someone who's covered housing and development in San Francisco for a long time, what do you make of this debate in Hayes Valley? What do you think it says about the city's housing crisis when A temporary solution for a plot of land becomes this treasured part of the neighborhood. And now it's at the heart of this debate that's been kind of happening in slow motion. Yeah, it's very rare, I think, where you have such strong arguments on both sides. Oftentimes you're talking about a surface parking lot being developed and the the opponents are against it because of shadows or traffic, or they don't want market rate housing. Here you have a situation where the people who are fighting to keep proxy are are not making any of those arguments. Rather than saying, you know, we don't want this, they're saying what we have is so great and it is used by so many people and it's such a benefit to the community. Let's put this affordable housing somewhere else. You know, you could argue that's like the classic NIMBY thing, you know, not here. But in this situation, you know, they're saying, you know, we we would accept this housing anywhere else. But here we have something special. Why not try to keep it? So then how will the fate of this plot of land be decided? Where are we at in the process now? So the mayor's office of housing and community development is preparing a request for proposals. Originally, the RFP was going to come out this summer, but now it looks like it's going to be the fall or later. So I think it will play out probably mostly next year. I mean, they could just delay it forever. I mean, there's plenty of projects, uh, affordable housing projects that have been in the pipeline for decades. And so this could just become another one of those if politically, if nobody wants to deal with it. The debate could just become even more slow moving. It could. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but I think Dean Preston is committed to making it happen. It could, you know, it could come to a head relatively soon. And that probably eventually the the city attorney might have to weigh in on to what extent is Prop I a legal obligation and what would have to happen in order to, you know, make proxy permanent. Well, JK, a fascinating debate. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. 
J.K. Deneen covers housing and real estate development for The Chronicle. Find his story about Hayes Valley's proxy online at sfchronicle.com and on The Chronicle app. This episode was produced by Keith Manconi and edited by Gary Baca. Thanks for listening. <laughs>